Take your Bibles and turn to the book of John chapter 8. The book of John chapter 8 really fits into this message this morning to think of ourselves, to look at ourselves as uh, unworthy sinners and uh, helpless and hopeless without the Savior. That's right. But oh, the thought that Jesus loves me, you know, it's all about him. Amen. I was thinking about that this week. I can't remember what keep my mind made me think about it, but you know, it is. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him yes, and what he has done for us. We're going to look at a story in scripture in John chapter 8. I want to preach on this subject, convicted but not converted. Convicted but not converted. John chapter 8 and starting at verse number 1. Let's read through this story. It's a beautiful story. Here's what the Bible says in John 8, verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him. Look at that. They didn't want an answer to their question. They, they asked the question to tempt him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Verse 8. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the elders, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Look at verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Convicted, but not converted. I want to talk for a few minutes in the beginning as introduction about conviction. Conviction. True conviction is only brought by God. Conviction. We get convicted because, many times, because we're guilty. And, uh, you know, because we're guilty brings conviction. You know, when I stand up and preach a gospel message, those that are here that are not saved ought to feel conviction. Amen? That's right. They ought to. But also, as a Christian, you, you understand if you're saved, you know what conviction is. And through your Christian life, you get convicted of things. Preacher gets up and preaches on something and maybe you've been a little uh, lax in your prayer life and the preacher preaches on prayer and you get convicted about it. Uh, maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, not reading your Bible, not witnessing something like that and the preacher preaches and uh, even if he just mentions it in a sermon, you get convicted. We used to call it back in my day when I was a kid, I heard people after church say, boy, I really got my toe stepped on. Amen. You know what that is? It's called conviction. Right. Conviction. I would hate to go to a church where I never got any conviction. Amen. Amen? Right. Conviction is, is brought on by God. It's given by God. And so if you don't feel any conviction, if you go to a church for, for six months and never get convicted over something, I think I'd be looking at changing churches. I would want God to speak to me and God to convict me. Why? Because I'm not perfect. Amen? Right. And neither are you. 
We're not perfect and we ought to feel some conviction about some things. Conviction shows that a change is needed. Something needs to change. That's what the Holy Spirit does and when he speaks to your heart when you hear something and, and, and he touches your heart about it and you know I need to change some things. Maybe there's some things that I need to stop doing and other things I need to start doing. Uh, it's conviction. Being, by the way, being convinced is not being convicted. There's a difference there. Just because you're convinced of something does not mean you're convicted about it. Jesus here is teaching. He went to the Mount of Olives, as it says in verse number one, and he came to the temple. The Bible says there early in the morning, and he sat down and he taught them. Jesus is teaching. Go back to chapter seven and verse 53, the last verse of chapter seven. And every man went unto his own house. Now here he was teaching and preaching and everybody went to their own house. And then in verse, in chapter eight, he's in Jerusalem because he's there at the Mount of Olives and he goes to the temple and uh, uh, notice there, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Every man, in chapter seven, verse 53, they went to their own house, but in chapter eight, then Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. You know why Jesus went to the Mount of Olives? <laughs> Because he didn't have a home to go to. He said foxes have holes and the birds have nests. But the son of man hath not where to lay his head. I don't know. Maybe the night before he spent time with uh, Mary and Martha. And stayed with them. Or maybe he camped out there on the Mount of Olives. I, I, you know, I have been there. I've been there in February. And uh, it does get a little bit cool at night. But not too cold. Nothing like what we had. Amen. How'd you like to sleep outside tonight? No, thank you. I'm ready for the polar vortex to go back to north of uh, the North Pole. Amen. <laughs> wow. It is cold. We've got some colder weather coming, but it doesn't get quite that cold. But they, you know, maybe he stayed there. I don't know. But he came. The Bible says, now look at this in verse two. Early in the morning, he came again. Look at the word again into the temple. He'd been there before. He came again. When had he been there before? Several times, but he had been there back when he was around 12 years old as a boy. And he taught in the temple back then. And he comes back here again to the temple. This was his practice. Uh, Jesus was showing that it's good to be faithful to the house of God. And he came again. We all ought to be faithful to the house of God. Amen. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, that's what the Bible is teaching us here and showing us. And notice what happens in verse number two. He came again to the temple and all the people came unto him. When he walked in, they all came to him. And he sat down and taught them. He begins to teach them. I don't know what he was teaching on. I would have learned, loved to have heard the lesson that he taught there. You know, the Bible does tell us that not everything that Jesus preached and taught is written down in the Word of God. The books could not contain all that Jesus has, had done no. and was doing. But they came to him to hear what he had to say. Now, something happens. I don't know if they interrupted the middle of his teaching or if they waited till he was at the end. But they came, the scribes and the Pharisees in verse number three. Maybe they interrupted because they didn't like what he was teaching, which we see that on a lot of occasions when Jesus was preaching and teaching that the scribes and the Pharisees didn't like what he was teaching. I want you to notice my first point is this, the transgression. The transgression is found in verses three and four. Now let's look at what takes place here. Verse three, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. The transgression, here's the scribes and the Pharisees, the Bible says. They were religious people. They knew and studied the Old Testament. And they had a, a, a special a, a, a knowledge of the Old Testament and the laws and things. And through the years, especially the 400 silent years, they had added a lot of tradition to the law. And they said, you know, this is just like the law. 
Hey, listen, you know, folks, we have traditions. There can be good traditions. There can be bad traditions. But the question is, is it Bible? Is it what God said? They had made these traditions and made them into laws that had to be followed. They were religious people, and people just believed and accepted. But notice here, the Bible says when they came to him, they wanted to make themselves look good, and they wanted to make Jesus look bad. That's why they brought... They, I want you to know something about them in verses 3 and 4. Listen to me now. They did not care about the woman. That's right. Yep. They didn't care. They didn't care if she was stoned to death and what sin she had committed and what was going on. But they, they brought this woman. They found this woman. They brought, you know, as religious people, they should have been concerned about her. That's right. You know, it breaks my heart. You know, God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. Amen. That's who God is. And God wants, God wants the sinner to get right with him and to live a right life. You know why? Because God knows if you repent of your sin and get right with God and live for God, it's going to be better for you. You're going to have a better life. God knows that. God knows what's best for you. But these people that are supposed to be religious people and supposed to represent God to the people were opposite of what God is. They were just accusing, looking down their nose, pointing the finger. Better be careful when you point the finger. I said it just recently. You've got some fingers pointing back at you, right? You better, better be careful. Looking at others and looking at the problem and the fault of others. We have our own faults, amen? amen? Hey, listen, I know, and I've said this before. Boy, when that guy or that gal or whoever it is, uh, someday is going to have to stand before God. And that's true, amen? But guess what? I'm going to have to stand before God too, right? Amen. Amen? That's right. We all are. Don't be so condemning and pointing the finger at others. These were religious people, but the problem is they were convicted, but not converted. They were reformed, but not reborn. They professed to know God, but they didn't possess God. There's a huge difference there. They brought this woman before the Lord. Here is a woman taken in the very act of adultery. Now I want you to notice something here about adultery. Let's stop here for a minute and think about this. This story does not suggest that adultery is okay. In no way, in no way is it suggesting that it's okay. She's, she's fine. No, she's sin. Amen. It's wicked sin. Adultery is sin. Amen. Amen? It's wrong. It is sin. And the Bible says she was taken in the very act. I, I wonder, as I look at this, how did these religious men know that? Hmm. Makes you really scratch your head, doesn't it? How did they know that? How did, did they search out this woman? Did they... How much did these religious leaders really know about her? They weren't concerned about that. They didn't care about that. They just wanted to point the accusing finger. Here is her sin. And they wanted to broadcast it out. Now here's Jesus teaching with all the people around him. And they bring her right in front of everybody. How sad. How terrible. How embarrassing and bad this was. But why didn't they wait till the people left, till Jesus was done? And why didn't they, I mean, why, why? Right in the temple. They were right in the temple. And doing this. Bringing this woman and pointing at her. But wait a minute. They should have come to Jesus and asked for forgiveness for their own sin. Amen. Yeah. But these were religious people. And they couldn't admit they had done wrong. That they, they were perfect. They were okay. And, and, and uh, they didn't want anybody to think of their wrongdoing and their sin. So they pointed somebody else. And the Bible says they all they were doing here was trying to tempt the Lord Jesus and, and trying to, you know, accuse somebody else and get the attention on that. I want you to notice, secondly, my second point here is this, the temptation. 
the temptation. We see the transgression and now the temptation. And that's verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. Let's read there again, verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us. Here they are. They, they knew the Old Testament. They knew the law. Here Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Do you understand in the question they wanted to make a division? They wanted to say the law's over here, but you're over here, just by their very question. Was Jesus against the law? No. Did he break any laws? No. Was there a division between him and the law? No, there wasn't. But they were trying to do that. Okay, but what do you say? What, what's different with you? Look at verse 6. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. Already, earlier in the ministry of Christ, and this is not, this is not at the end of his ministry. This is uh, in the middle or earlier. They already wanted to accuse him way back then. They finally were able to get an accusation at the time of the crucifixion when Judas Iscariot came and betrayed him and all of that took place. But they had already tried before that. I want you to notice that. They tried it all through his ministry. They didn't like his popularity and what he was saying and what he was doing. They didn't like him, didn't accept who he was. So that they might have to accuse him. Verse 6, but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. As though he heard them, didn't even regard them, just started writing. Verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now they tempted him. They wanted to say that he was not true to the law and they wanted to accuse him. Now, they were under, of course, the rule of Rome at that time. The way the Old Testament talks about uh, the execution in Jew, in, 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 for the Jews was a stoning, stoned to death. But they were not allowed under the Roman rule to do that. And so now they're under Roman rule, and by Roman law, they could not put this woman to death. It wasn't legal, it wasn't lawful. So it, again, that all gets mixed in here. Turn back to Deuteronomy. Go way back in your Bible to Deuteronomy. Let me show you what the law says. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22. Deuteronomy 22, 22. Here's how God addressed this situation. If a man, notice this, if a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman. So shalt thou put away evil from Israel. Now the law says this. By the way, <laughs> the old saying is, it takes two to tango. That's right. Amen. Go back to the New Testament. Where's the man? Where's the man? They brought the woman accusing her, but where's the man? It takes two to commit adultery, right? I mean, you know, where is the man? You're not practicing the law. If you really knew the law and practiced the law, you're not practicing the law. They just, again, they just wanted to accuse him. What is it going to be here? Are we going to follow the law or are we going to see grace? You know, the whole part of the biggest reason Jesus came was to switch this over from the law to grace. When he died on the cross, the veil of the temple was rent in two, and a, a lot of these Old Testament laws um, were put away. That didn't mean that adultery is okay, it's not a sin anymore. No, it's still a sin. But before you start accusing and pointing the finger, what about grace? Amen? Amen? What about grace? They were concerned about keeping up with their law, but what about the soul of this poor woman? She has a soul like anybody else. It's going to spend eternity in one place or the other, heaven or hell. Where is the grace? I'm not saying, and God is not saying, and Jesus is not saying that adultery is okay. No, it's a dirty, rotten sin. But wait a minute, 
we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen? That's right. We all. We all need His grace. And so now they're trying to accuse Him. You're not following the law. That's what they're trying to say. Trying to spread it all around to the people right in front of who He was teaching. Maybe He was teaching there that day a lesson on grace. They should have been there for the lesson, right? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. They're trying to accuse him. But Jesus has an answer. Oh, what an answer that he gives them. First of all, he stooped down, verse number 6, and began to write on the ground. And then he says, in verse 7, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Who among you is without sin? You know, only a non-sinner can rightfully judge. Only, listen to that, only a non-sinner, only a perfect person can rightfully judge. That's why God is our judge. Jesus is our judge. All right? Because they, they are perfect. No sin. I want you to go to, over to chapter 8. Look at verse number, uh, verse number 15 and 16. Look what Jesus said later on in the story. He said, "Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. Amen. It is. For I am not alone, but I and the Father hath sent me. Now go over to John chapter 3. Go back to John chapter 3. And John chapter 3 is the famous story of Jesus and his conversation and teaching to uh to Nicodemus here, a ruler of the Jews. Now, Nicodemus was one of the Pharisees also. I don't think he was with this group accusing that woman because of what took place in John chapter 3. But look what he says in John chapter 3. Look at verse 17. John 3, we all know 16. Look at verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Hey, it's not judgment time. It's not condemnation time. It's grace time. And I'm coming to offer mercy and grace. Aren't you glad when you realize that you were a sinner and, and deserving of hell and you came to Jesus Christ as a sinner to ask for forgiveness and, and to uh, confess your sin that Jesus didn't say to you, hey, uh, you know, it's time for judgment. You don't. You don't deserve. Hey, listen, I'm so glad he didn't do that. Amen. I'm so glad he offered mercy and grace and reached his hand out to me. In fact, he was reaching out to us before we reached back to him. Amen. Amen. Reaching out to offer mercy and grace to us and forgiveness to us. Hey, listen, there is a time when his grace and mercy and forgiveness is done. When a person passes from this earth into eternity... Hey, after you get into eternity, you can't come back and change it. That's right. I mean, you know, people that are in hell are not offered this. Mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Amen. There comes a time when it's done. That's why anybody that's lost without Christ better accept it while they have a chance because they may never get another opportunity. That's right. And so we see here in this story, he begins to... Show them that he has the answer. Now, here's a question. This question has plagued Bible scholars all down through history. Okay? And it's probably, maybe you were thinking of it too here. In verse 6, Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground. Then it says, you know, he answered them. And then it says in verse 8, and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Here's the question. What did he write? Amen. Everybody's asked that question. And here's the answer. We have no idea. Amen. We do not know. If God wanted us to know, he would have put it in his word. That's right. But we don't, we do not know. So as I studied and read through this, there's a lot of speculations. But here's one that really made me think a little bit. That maybe one of one of the Bible scholars says maybe that when Jesus stooped down and began to write on the ground. He was writing down the sins of those Pharisees and scribes that were standing there. 
And maybe he was writing there, uh, John, no, John. Okay, John is a Bible name, but I'm not talking about John who wrote this. All right. John from um, Galilee. Okay. Now, on this day, you stole from your neighbor. On this day, here's what you did. And then he writes down the next guy's name. And he begins to write his sins out. Wow. No wonder the Bible says in verse 9, And when they heard it, that being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one. <laughs> he started to write their name down. and go, whoa, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't need to tempt the Lord anymore. I don't need to hear what's going on. He knows me. He knows all about me. And I'm leaving before he embarrasses me. I think that would possibly be. Maybe he was writing down some scripture from the Old Testament that would speak to them. I don't know. We don't know. But it must, must have been something. And the, But the Bible says here this in verse, in verse 9. They which heard it. Now, that makes me think that it wasn't necessarily just the writing here, but it was his answer in verse 7. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. I mean, if you're, if you're sinless, if you have no sin, you know what the Lord was saying to them? You need to ask me for forgiveness. Why? Because you're a sinner. That's why, if you think it through, maybe he was writing their sins down. They're not sinless. They can't judge. Who do they think they are? Are they putting themselves in the place of God? Accusing this woman. He writes on the sand. He answers and then he goes back down and writes on the sand. And all of a sudden, pretty soon he looks up and they're all gone. Let's go to my third point. My third point is this. The transformation. The transformation. Amen. Trip. Uh, tr transgression and then temptation and then transformation. That's what happens when anybody comes to Christ. There's a transformation that takes place. Old things are passed away. All things become new. Amen. Look at what it says here verses 9, 10, and 11. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one beginning at the eldest even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? They came all here condemning you of your sin, but then they got convicted by their own sin, and so they left instead of staying and getting right. Who is the only one that stayed and got right? The woman they were accusing. That's right. Amen. Wow. This is a, what a great story. Look at verse 11. She said, no man, Lord. Lord. I'll come back to that in a second. No man. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Conviction. Conviction. Instead, these Pharisees and scribes standing around, instead of coming to Christ, they left. They walked away. I don't know, in my ministry and pastoring of more than 25 years, I just wonder how many people sat in the congregation and heard a message from the Word of God and were convicted, but they walked out instead of walking down here. They walked out in their sin and said, I'm going to stay in my sin and I'm not going to accept Christ as my Savior. And they walked out the door and walked away. But praise God, there's been some that have come down the altar and said, I need to get saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. I need to get saved. All of these walked away when they should have stayed and, and trusted in Him and gotten right with God. Listen, the conviction will not save you. They were convicted, but they walked away from it. Conviction doesn't save you. That's right. What saves you is accepting the Lord as your Savior. Accepting and admitting your sin. She didn't try to argue with them. She was a sinner. 
And you know what? That's the first step to salvation is admitting that you are a sinner. Amen. I, I don't care if it's big sins or small sins. Sin is sin. That's right. right? And we're all sinners. She stayed. And then the Bible says she called him Lord. That meant a great deal in that day for her to recognize Jesus as Lord. These scribes and Pharisees couldn't recognize it. Their eyes were blinded by their own sin and by Satan himself. And they didn't come to Christ, but she did. By the way, they were accusing, they were trying to accuse the Lord. In the scripture, in the Bible, who is the accuser? The devil is. Satan is. He's the accuser. They were doing the work of Satan, no matter how religious, didn't matter how religious they were, they still did the work of the devil. And they just walked away. But she stayed, and she recognized who he was. The conversion takes place. Hey, listen. Condemnation, pointing the finger, all of this that takes place, but these scribes and Pharisees were not her judge. Amen. They condemned her, but they were not her judge. Jesus was. That's right. And Jesus says, I'll forgive you. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. What an answer. What a statement. Go and sin no more. Quit, uh, quit condemning others. Quit pointing the finger at others. And just get right with God and accept him and be saved and be born again. Amen. To so many of us, Jesus has said these words. When we got saved, it's just like Jesus said to us, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Go, your sins are forgiven, washed away in the blood, and live for God all of your life. Trust him and live for him. Now I end with verse 12. Here's what Jesus said. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Notice here, Jesus says, I am. He is the I am. Through the scriptures, he says, I am the true vine. He, he says, I am the shepherd. He says, I am the bread. I am the water. Who is he? He's God. That's who he is. He's the I am. And here he is. I am the light of of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I'm so glad today that when I got saved, the light was turned on. Amen? Amen. The light was turned on. I'm not walking through this world in darkness anymore. I have the light of Jesus Christ himself to show me how to live and show me what to do and, and uh, blessing and guiding me in my life. I remember those days of darkness before I got saved, how it was stumbling about through life. But thank God, he's the light of the world. Amen. Are you sharing that light with someone else? Any person can be saved by coming to the light. He forgives sins. That's what he does. I mean, he's capable and he's able and he loves to forgive. Jesus cares about all of us, every one of us. Whatever we've been through, Whatever we faced in life, he cares about me and he cares about you. He cares about your troubles, your trials, the things you have to face, the hard times. Jesus cares and he loves you and he wants to lead you and guide you. Would you follow him?